So welcome back, everybody, from the coffee break. Uh, Gordon, thanks a lot for having us here uh, with this great meeting and for thanks also to, to your team for all the efforts of organizing this meeting. So I'm chairing this uh, second session, um, which doesn't come with a title, but uh, the good news is we, uh, we have really exciting signs uh, with uh, also Salome being then the, the second speaker. Um, I wanted to start with a presentation which is maybe less so of a scientific focus but more of a clinical focus because that is an ambition I have for my career to really also do something which that translates into the clinic. And I'm learning by taking those steps what that requires and how we could proceed in that direction. And the focus here is on fatty liver disease. Uh, you see here a picture of a liver which is then moving from a healthy status to a, in the end, hepatic, uh, so hepatic cancer state with all the <coughs> stages in between, fibrosis as one of the key aspects of uh, worsening of the liver status. And uh, we have some recent data <coughs> pointing to the validity of glycomics for picking up the disease. So my presentation will start on technology, how to measure glycans, then it will look it, uh, broadly into diseases, what are the glycomic signatures of different diseases, are these aligned or different? From there, we will look then into liver disease and fibrosis markers. And in the end, I have two slides on COVID. So a bit of a uh, mixed portfolio. So we'll look at blood in this case, where the endothelium is covered with a glycocalyx, but also the content, the blood with its cells and the proteins is rich of uh, glycans. So Actually, the bulk of the glycans is not on the cells in the blood, but the bulk of the end glycans is really on the acute phase proteins and immunoglobulins, which are in serum and blood now. Those are the major contributors to blood glycan. And I'll show you some evidence for that. And uh, we do blood because it's accessible. And blood for me is an umbrella term, meaning whole blood or serum or plasma. And the workflow we use for this is as follows. It's on a robot, and that was already mentioned by Ken, that we need robotization for these workflows. Uh, what we do is we take a few microliters of serum or plasma, we release the, glyc uh, the glycans by PNGSA, and then a key step, really key for what I show today, is the derivatization of the silic acids. We established this already more than 10 years ago, but we are still happy having this methodology. So we turn isomers into different chemical entities with a different distinct mass by lactonization or ether ether formation. So different masses which allow you to dis differentiate between the two three linked and two six linked silic acids. We do a cleanup and then we do a mass spec analysis of these glycans um, and the, the whole sample prep here or the big parts of the sample prep are performed on a robot. So the sample prep is not a big issue. This is what we then get, we get a mass spectrum, so we measure all the glycans which are derived from different uh, diversity of proteins, let's say acute phase proteins, alpha-1 acid glycoprotein, immunoglobulins, all these glycans in the bulk, we measure them by mass spectrometry. And they are very diverse, as you can see here. So they are oligomonocytic, they are diantenary, triantenary, tetraantenary, different salic acid linkages. So we have close to 100 different glycans that we are measuring. And one key aspect is we can measure this robustly, so we can measure it today, we can measure it tomorrow, and uh, we uh, also can see that storage of samples is not a big issue, so if you store dry blood spots, as indicated here, for a couple of weeks at room temperature, you can still release all those glycans and measure them, and the storage time will not affect the glycomic signature, so these are very stable and robust signatures, which you can gain from serum, from plasma, or from the dry blood spots. Now, once we have measured all these glycans, we will take all these intensities of the glycans and do some calculations. For example, we will uh, look into diantenary glycans as indicated here. We will specify the silic acid linkages. So how many of these diantenary glycans do have silic acid? Um, how many of them are bisected, indicated by a B? How many are diantenary, indicated by, by A2? How many are fucosylated, indicated by an F? So we do glycosylation traits, which reflect the structure and the biosynthesis of these glycans. 
again, uh, repeatability and robustness is very important. So low error bars, high precision of the methodology. And then we do indeed all these calculations, which reflect then antenarity, how many complex type glycans do we have, how many have two, three, four antennae, how many of the triantenary glycans do have a two, three link silic acid or two, six link silic acid. So all of those granularities we pick up in specific traits where we do uh, some calculations of the indi individual glycans. And now, this was on the technology. Now the next part is really just on assessing how is glycosylation now changing with disease and how is it also different between male, female and uh, changing with age for our specific method. And we, we went for this type of normalization where we uh, looked at um, age association as indicated here. And uh, we looked at sex differences and also at interaction. <coughs> and I can tell you, all we see here makes sense. So we see, for example, that uh, glycans, which do not have uh, a silic acid and are dientenary, are going, up in are going down in galactosylation with age. So we see all the sex and age differences, which we already know from literature. I will not go into detail on that, but we have kind of this landscape of age and sex association as a background and based on top of this we now look into disease signatures and here is a list of the diseases which we are looking at and there we again look now at these glycosylation traits and those are summarized here so a variety of different uh, traits like total um, manositic lichens total hybrid type lichens total complex type lichens and so on. So we do this for a number of diseases, but let's uh, first look at the list of diseases. We have a number of different cancers. And I think the key message I want to convey here is not each cancer is the same. And I mean, that's obvious for solid uh, cancers versus multiple myeloma. But we also see that all the solid type cancers like breast cancer, pancreatic cancer, and colon cancer have quite distinct signatures, consensus signatures in terms of glycosylation. And the the central line here is healthy controls, which we have in each of these cohorts. So these are really cohort studies of the last 10 years. And then we just look in this cohort study, is this glycosylation trait going up or going down? And is that the case? Uh, for how does that relate to another cohort study? So you can now look at this pattern, if you're interested, and look, for example, at all the cancers. So do they go in the same direction? You can ask um, diantenary glycan galactosylation, which we know for RA, in antibodies, it's affected. Do we see a similar tendencies of lower galactosylation also for other diseases? I will not go into detail, but that's kind of how you can look at, the, at these signatures. We also have COVID in. So then you see, for example, for this diantenary glycan, which is with a few codes, if you look at their galactosylation, then COVID is high. But if you look, for example, for uh, these glycans, diantenary glycans with a few codes but without a silic acid, that's this S0, then galactosylation is very low for leishmaniasis, infectious disease. So the most profound agalactosylation phenotype of these glycans, which are IgG related, we see in leishmaniasis being a very inflammatory disease. So you, you start uh, to, to try and lay connections what is the inflammation status of these patients? How does that relate to certain glycosylation traits? So it's a complex landscape, but one message, key message is not, all these diseases are different and not only in IgG related diantenary glycans, but also in triantenary and tetraantenary glycans. I think we don't really don't have time to go <laughs> through all of these uh, granularities. Um, but this was the kind of the, general disease landscape, which I was uh, wanted to, to set up. And now we'll look into fibrosis in uh, fatty liver diseases. And uh, the map here just is very red, indicating that uh, fatty liver disease is increasing in virtually all parts of the world. And it's a big health problem. And how is it caused? I would say, look at us, look at you. It's our lifestyle for a big part, our food, our sedentary lifestyle, all of that. I mean, we are very busy. We have a sleep, uh, sleep shortage, let's put it that, all of that. And that's all contributing to this uh, fatty liver condition. 
And now what we did recently is two small studies. First, a discovery study where we said, okay, interesting, we see a signature of fatty liver disease. And then we said, now we wanna see in fatty liver disease, we have uh, different stages of fibrosis, which are thought to the be the key determinants of a bad disease course. So the more your liver is getting fibrotic, the more you are, you will move towards cirrhosis and then also to liver cancer. So that's the key, key critical issue. And nowadays, this fibrosis is measured by biopsies. And we said, okay, if our glycomic signature conveys the very same information, I mean, I would prefer giving a droplet of blood from having my liver punctured on a regular basis. So that was kind of the motivation for the study. And we looked into that, so we have all these fibrosis stages here. And then we asked, is our signature picking up this fibrosis? And that's actually shown here. So if you look at the graph here, we see in the volcano plot some glycans which are going down with fibrosis and others going up with fibrosis. Now the L indicates 2,3-linked salic acid, which is going down. And the E indicates 2,6-linked salic acid, which is going up. So all we see in this disease is not a very complex change of glycosylation, but really just the one thing happening, 2,3-linked salylation is going down, 2,6 is going up. And that's also vis uh, visualized here. So fibrosis kicks in here with stage one. So all the pre-fibrotic stages have high to three linked salylation and then it goes down. And the C6 goes in the other direction. Once fibrosis starts, it goes up. So a very, I would say, homogeneous signature of, uh, of glycosylation which, we, which reflects fibrosis. And that's actually where we are. We are now recruiting additional replication cohorts and we wanna see whether this is really a promising marker which hopefully at a certain moment will allow us to replace liver biopsies and help also to do these liver health assessments more broadly, maybe as a practitioner, you know, because now our liver health is not all poorly affected. And this is just to summarize again uh, what we pick up with the glycosylation trait. So we have fibrosis, which is done by liver puncture and biops by the pathologist. So they do the fibrosis assessment. And as you can see, our glycomic markers quite nicely, positively or negatively associate with the fibrosis. Now, just to remind you, the nice thing here is that, yet th that you can do this indeed also just from a single droplet of blood, where you also get the very same glycan signatures registered. And these uh, signatures are stable over some weeks. So what you could envision is you go to the practitioner or you, you have some sampling at home, just a dry blood spot. You put it in, a, in an envelope, it's sent to a lab, assessed, and within maybe a week or two, you get your information, your liver is doing fine, is doing better, or you need additional attention. Good, and now two more slides on, on COVID. I will not go into detail on that, but just to show you, here we have also a volcano, volcano plot indicating for patients that got admitted to our hospital with the first wave of, of COVID, so that was spring of 2020, People got admitted, some got needed intensive care, others were at the, at the normal um, hospital beds. And then blood was drawn on a every second, every third day. And these were collected, these uh, blood samples. And in the end we said, okay, there's some leftovers. Let's do these glycomic signatures for all of these samples, for which was 1000 samples or so. So, and then we asked at the moment of admission, when patients are in a bad shape, come in do they have a different blood glycome compared to um, healthy controls? So that's what we asked here. And yes, they have a different blood glycome. So what we see is IgG-related glycans are going down. They are down with the disease. And all the acute phase protein-related glycans are up with the disease. So antibodies are important in COVID, but still, if you look at the proteins in the blood, it's mainly acute phase proteins going up and antibodies going down. And the, the signature is even more pronounced if you look at the day of their worst status. So most highest disease severity, which could be after five or 10 days at the hospital, maybe at the intensive care, they reach the bottom. And, and then you have a very, very distinct signature. And again, acute phase protein glycans are highly up and antibody-related glycans are down. And now we said, 
are we picking up protein-specific glycosignatures? And that is uh, when we said, okay, let's look what we know about antibody glycosylation for this cohort, whether we can pick that up also in this simple total blood glycome. And this has done before, has been done before, but now what we see here is antibody glycosylation, which we analyzed by pulling out the antibodies, generating peptides, and measuring FC glycosylation of the antibodies. So that's in a different paper. But now, do we find the very same trait back or a, a related trait in our total blood glycome signature? And we do. So if you look at specific glycans in your blood glycome, they reflect very, very nicely what you find for the antibody in the CH2 domain uh, in terms of glycosylation. So it's not just a fuzzy random glycan signature we're generating, but we are really picking up glycosylation features of specific proteins at specific sites. And uh, in this case, we only had a small control group. So we said, what we want to see is that some of these glycosylation features associating with disease also associate with disease severity. So we did, mit we did uh, three disease severity groups as shown here. And what we see is indeed many of these traits do also associate with disease severity. So they differed between patients and controls, but they also show a more profound signature or a bigger effect for the most severe cases like these ones here in the last, pan, uh, last uh, column. So this brings me to the conclusions. So human diseases do have glycomic signatures in the blood. They also have, of course, tissue glycomic signatures, we, which we are not revealing and which may be very, very different, but they are somehow reflected systemically in the blood. Our liver is responding, our immune system is responding to our health status, and glycans are changing in all possible directions. <coughs> and you can pick up these signatures via dry blood spot, serum, or plasma. Signatures are very, very much alike. And then we have the big advantage of storage, so glycans are stable, and we can keep them for weeks. And that's a big difference for towards, uh, for example, metab metabolic studies where we have to be very cautious with sampling, with storage. So here we are in a luxury position. And then we are thrilled by seeing that this uh, MASH liver inflammation in, a, in yeah, fatty liver conditions is um, with fibrosis as a consequence is reflected in the 2,3 and 2,6 hyaluration. And we think this has serotonical potential. What is also uh, important for me is to see that uh, these TPNG glycosylation signatures uh, really reflect protein-specific and site-specific glycosylation changes. So, of course, in the end, I would love to measure all the hundreds of proteins and thousands of sites and define all the glycans out there, and that's a very good do, uh, goal to go for. But what we have now is already valuable. It already uh, is a good proxy for many of those site-specific glycosylation changes. At least that's what our IgG data indicate. And we think there are these markers, and now we look at a fibrosis marker, but I mean, Gordon's team also has other uh, blood glycomic markers. We have other markers. There's more markers out there. Um, they have potential for clinical translation. What we need is really a good technology uh, platform so that we can measure these glycans from clinical samples to support clinicians in decision making. making. And, uh, Gordon and my team will certainly team up for that in the coming years to make that happen. So that's actually what I wanted to share with you. I, will, I want to acknowledge <laughs> also the people involved, many clinicians, so from the uh, COVID team, the gastroenterologist for the liver diseases, of course. We work a lot with, uh, with the guest tour from uh, Duncan, uh, with the rheumatologist, of course, who are here in the audience. And I want to thank you for your attention. Good. There's a few questions. Uh, we have a microphone. Hi, Manfred. Very nice talk. I have a question. I mean, liver fibrosis could be a previous step before the progression to hepatocellular carcinoma. Yes. Did you evaluate uh, uh, a potential predictive impact of the glycome signature in terms of progression, risk of progression uh, to hepatocellular carcinoma? 
these are indeed the relevant questions. So what can we grasp with these signatures? The numbers we have now are way too small for that. But, uh, but those, um, I guess for that we really have to do a couple hundred, maybe 1,000 samples to have robust signatures predicting these risks. Because there's diverse disease causes and you will also have to look into historic sample collections. These are precious. So if you know any clinicians who can be helpful with their sample collections, we would love to address this question. Anand. Yeah, so a very nice talk as well. So how does your glycomic signature of acetic acid compare to what Nico did with his glycosero test? Yes, so we had a couple of calls already with Nico. Actually what we did, uh, we also calculated a proxy of his signature from our rich glycan traits. So that has a predictive power of fibrosis, but only with an area under the curve of maybe 0.65 or so. So ours is clearly outperforming at least in, in these data. Um, so I think the cytic acid is critical and what, what Nico's approach do, uh, did and does is removing the cytic acids. So those are really complementary. He picks up other features and his features have value, but for this f specific fibrosis, you need the cytic acids. And we actually are looking into replicate, uh, analyzing his samples, you know, to, s to really demonstrate the added value of the cytic acid. So hopefully we can do that in the coming few months. Yuri. And Nick's signature is also for fibrosis or for cirrhosis? Yeah, it, it's less so for fibrosis. It has, it's more now used to, uh, for to pick up cirrhosis and, uh, and risk for liver cancer indeed. Yeah. So that also means he picks up other features which have a different clinical value, you're right. Yeah. I think my question is related to the previous two, but yeah. okay. Two, three down, two, six up. Why? Do you have any like speculation, like mechanistic, yeah. like why? Yeah. What's <laughs> going on here? Of course, what we started is uh, looking into uh, liver transcriptomic data because many of the proteins are likely liver derived. We said, okay, maybe it's already there with the biosynthesis, um, but the transcriptomics was not fully aligned with what we see in the, in the circulation. So we, we have to look into that. If you have specific ideas, yeah. let me know. Do you see, I don't know, increase in oligomonose? Or in this case, it's really the linkages. I mean, all the other things are hardly uh, changing. Are and we see the change in linkages on diantenary, triantenary, tetraantenary. So it's all the same. They are all shifting. Yeah. Thank you. It's a great talk. So um, I'm very curious. You mentioned the cyanidic acid is very important maybe for fibrogenesis like that to six, right? So is any cyanic acid derivatives can, let's say, used to against fibrosis, liver fibrosis? I'm not aware of that. But I mean, if you think that these data could stimulate no, research, no, no. no. I mean, okay. some, I, uh, because you already find the cyanic acid, for example, alpha two, six, yeah. this, uh, um, let's say, structure, right? Yeah. So important. Uh, link to this uh, fibrosis. Uh, I'm curious, maybe some uh, cyanic acid derivative, this compound, maybe disturb this uh, function, for example, cyanic acid link to this uh, fibrosis against uh, liver fibrosis, MASH, or just like MASH, LD. Yeah. So, uh, so what I understand is you're speculating on the mechanism, how this? Not the mechanism, Any anybody or the child try to use this cyanic acid uh, yeah. derivative. For example, it's so a Tamiflu against, you know, mm -hmm. that one is uh, uh, produced uh, by Rose, this company against yeah. the virus. But this one maybe also can against the fibrosis, yeah. not only. I mean, yeah. I think w w what I get from your question is that this could contribute to the disease path pathology, our signature. Yes. And yeah. actually we are not sure about that. Okay, it could okay. be that this is in the disease uh, pathology path, but maybe okay. it's also just an epi phenomenon. Yeah, 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 Equally valuable, I would say, for a diagnosis, but I don't know whether it's a, a good thing for therapeutic. I mean, the nice thing is we now have therapeutics which are entering the market or a clinical trials, yeah. and what we need is really these diagnostics which tell you which of the patients are in need for of these new therapeutic agents which are coming in. So it's, I think it's very timely to have such a non-invasive marker for, even for clinical trials for patient stratification. Yeah, I'm just curious. Very yeah. good. Thank you. Okay, then uh, thanks for all the questions.
And then we move on. Salome is our next uh, speaker. Salome Pinjo from uh, Porto. So I'm happy to collaborate with her a lot on uh, different projects. I will close this one here.